Big you Mac, is he going to be a chance. baseball player? Yeah, like, under, yeah. uh, this and that. Mark McGuire. Mark McGuire. <laughs> <laughs> Big Mac. <laughs> That's right. Him and his brother and Big Mac and Jumbo Jack. Big Mac <laughs> and Jumbo Jack. <laughs> Big Mac and Little Jumbo Jack. Right? There's Big Mac. I think McKinley's going to be bigger than Jack. Is. It's looking like it. Yeah, it looks like a doll. It's just like a bunch of lead. Mom, you want to see what he's looking at? What's that song? Pretty Blue Eyes? I know, he has... I figured we were going to read story. This is going to be all backlit and screwed up, but a new, new, new picture books. Just like staring at Grandma. But it's not very exciting. But uh, where were you? Where were you born? I was born back in Missouri. My dad and, and mother uh, were sharecroppers. And uh, I stayed, stayed in the, uh, I went out of the state of Missouri until I was about uh, graduated from high school. And uh, when I graduated from high school in 1939, and, uh, we didn't have any money, so my mom uh, talked to old Freddie Short, who run the clothing store. Uh, if he would sell me a suit, she'd pay for it on time. And I forget now what she paid down on 25 cents or 50 cents, but the suit cost seven dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> I think the shirt was about 49 cents. And the tie was 10 or 15 cents. And uh, I got the picture here somewhere if you want to see it. it, it I was quite striking. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, this was in 1939, and you couldn't buy, beg, or borrow a job. There was nothing, nobody wanted you. So uh, this other friend of mine who was a couple of years older, Lawrence Malson, uh, he came back to Missouri, and he was living in Maywood, California, in a hotel with uh, seven or eight other guys. So he said uh, he was coming back with a, what they, I don't know what they called them in those days, but this person was delivering an old 32 Chevrolet to somebody out here in California from Omaha, Nebraska. So he picked Lawrence and I up in Missouri and we helped him drive. And we came to California. And I lived in the Maywood Hotel down on Slauson Avenue. And it was funny, that's about when I was working for Griffiths. Many years later, that was only about six blocks from where our office was. <laughs> and I went by there many times. and. Uh, on a Friday night, they'd have a special T-bone steak dinner for uh -huh. 15 cents. <laughs> <laughs> was it any good? Oh, it was pretty tough, but <laughs> it was pretty nice. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was not very big. I, weighed, I think I weighed about 140 pounds at the time, and I wasn't too tall. And uh, I couldn't get a job in a foundry. And uh, I tried to get on at Alcoa Aluminum, and uh, you'd walk around all of the industrial area in, the, in Maywood, uh -huh. and uh, they'd have this big room where they were hiring people, and I never could get the attention of the guy hiring. So finally, I did get a job. I had it for about two weeks working at the Union Bag Company, but. Uh, they didn't pay any money, hardly at all, so I wrote back and told my mother that uh, if they could break together enough money for me to buy a bus ticket, I'd come back, because the National Guard, Missouri National Guard, was uh, mobilizing, and they were 
going to summer camps, and I think you could make about, I forget not exactly how much, about $9, I think, a month. You meet once a month, and uh, in the summertime, they'd go away for two weeks training. Mm -hmm. So I'd make a lot of money, you know. <laughs> so anyway, Mom sent me the money, and I went back on the Greyhound bus and joined the National Guard, went to summer camp, and uh, I carried uh, water on an old horse uh, around to the harvest people later on that summer when they were harvesting the wheat, cutting hay, oats, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd make 25 cents a day. These guys would chip in and want to give me two or three pennies or a dime or a nickel, which was a heck of a lot of money. But anyway, that fall, the National Guard uh, mobilized for one year. This was in 1940 by then. And uh, my mom was all upset. I was just a young guy. I'd never, I'd been to California and back, but that was all the real experiences I'd ever had. So anyway, when we mobilized, we went to uh, Columbia South. Carolina to Fort Jackson, which was about 10 miles out of Columbia, South Carolina. And we rode from Missouri, clear down there, probably, oh, I don't know, it was around 1,500 miles, I guess, in a, what they call a six by six mm -hmm. truck. And uh, it was pretty hard to go to the bathroom because you're riding on the old board seat. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was the starting of my exciting life in the, in the Army. And uh, on, oh, this was almost about a year later, I, I was eligible for a furlough to go home. And I had been to Columbia. And at that time, you, you only had to wear your uniform on on the base, but you could buy civilian clothes. And so I went, I bought me a new sport coat and pants and shirt, and to go back home on the furlough. And uh, on a Sunday, uh, December seventh, that's when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And I was sitting in this barracks with about eight or ten other guys mm -hmm. uh, playing poker. When the, the when we got the news, it was probably about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And shortly thereafter, the announcement why uh, they called us out on the line. First sergeant blew the whistle and we all fell out. All furloughs were canceled. You had to get rid of all of her civilian clothes. And this all happened in just an hour or two after. <laughs> what would you do with them all? I just had to send them home. Yeah. And I had an uncle, an uncle Cliff Porter, uh, who was going to college at the time uh, and teaching school in a little country school. So he was about my size, so I gave all of my clothes. I had mom give all of my clothes to him, which he was, <laughs> real happy about. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the furloughs were canceled and uh, that was the beginning of my experience in the, uh, in the Army. And I ended up being there almost uh, seven years before I got out. But uh, originally, if you'd gone in, in uh, for one year active duty, then they said we wouldn't uh, have to stay in the service, we'd have it all done, but of course Pearl Harbor changed all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then we went on the Louisiana maneuvers. And we didn't even have any real guns, we just used wooden guns, and we had uh, three quarter, uh, what they call a, a three quarter horse or three quarter pickup truck that we used to simulate a tank you know, on wooden guns, and we went through the Louisiana maneuvers like that. And uh, 
Then we moved from, uh, originally we were in field artillery, 105 howitzer uh, mm -hmm. guns, and I was in the radio section, uh, communications, and uh, I went to uh, radio school. Uh, where the heck was the first one I went to? I forget now. It's been a long time, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Uh, to put it all together just on the spur of the moment. I uh, anyway, the, we had uh, walkie-talkies two-way, and then I wanted to advance and uh, from uh, like what they called uh, land to air, you know, communicate with the uh, airplanes or something like that. Mm -hmm. The Morse code. So I went to school and. Uh, studied Morse code and, and uh, became a high-speed radio operator, which we never did use, uh, really, but uh, they came out with this real fancy, I think it was a number 506 uh, shortwave radio mm -hmm. that we communicated with just the secret codes and that sort of thing, but I, we never did use the dit dot ditty school. But, uh, I could, uh, the advantage was it's when I didn't have anything to do, I'd get the uh, news reports coming over the air. Mm -hmm. But they come over pretty doggone fast, so you had to be pretty on your toes and really concentrate to catch what the news was saying. And that was to my advantage. And that was all in code? Yeah, Morse code. Uh -huh. That's why they used to send telegrams and all that stuff, right. you know. from. Uh, Telegraph offices that you probably never heard of, but back then they were around all the railroad stations and yeah. in the little town. Yeah, and then the people would send you a message, and then yeah, right. someone would, and then it would be delivered to you right. like a. Right. That's what they call telegram. And we a had uh, codes uh, that uh, meant different things that we communicated with the different uh, outfits and. This was in order to keep the enemy from knowing what the hell you were talking about, you know. And, uh, but anyway, that was uh, over in Europe. right after we got through with the Louisiana maneuvers, they, we were, by this time we were getting some equipment. Mm -hmm. So they changed our uh, 128th Field Artillery Battalion into an armored division, where they mounted the uh, 105s on half-tracks. So we were kind of mobilized or whatever you want. Are those the trucks that have half? Yeah, it, they, it was they the, looked like a tank, but then they, they, wheels they, only the had, they didn't have any top on them, they had the sides. Right. It was with a real steel plated uh, armor on the, you know, where if you shot a high-powered rifle or something, and you were below that, they wouldn't, wouldn't hit you. Right. But anyway, uh, we left, uh, uh, we went to uh, get our half tracks and all that. We went to uh, some outfit or some base in uh, their camp in Missouri. Uh, can't recall it off. But anyway, we loaded everything onto the trucks. On the, or I mean, on the railroad, mm -hmm. flat cars and troop train, and we went from uh, uh, Arkansas to Camp Cook, California, and uh, we were what they called the Sixth Armored then, and uh, I still stayed in the communications end of it, and. Uh, they used, we'd go on maneuvers for two or three months at a time, and uh, by this time the, the war was was going along pretty good uh, when we joined uh, England mm -hmm. and uh, fighting the, the Germans. And uh, so, I, I forget how long we were in Camp Cook, a year I think or not so. All we were doing was training these 90-day wonders. They, we call them a 90-day wonder because they went to officer school. 
and uh, they became a second lieutenant or shave tail. And, uh, and we were training them with firing, you know, and I got so sick and tired of these guys, they couldn't hit the ocean with a scoop full of peas. <laughs> they could, you know, you'd have to zero in and, and then you'd have to tell the people where to bring the gun over so many up or down, left or right, to get on the target. Half of them never could get it done. But anyway, <laughs> I, uh, when I, the, the Air Force uh, that they called it then had priority. They wanted all kinds of, of pilots, you know, bomber pilots, fighter pilots, and all of this. And my good friend, uh, Squirrely Overmiller, we called him. Jack, Jack Overmiller. Uh, we uh, signed up to go into San Jose, uh, California, and t took the test for the Air Force. And uh, I, Jack, and I both passed it. So then we had to go for a physical, and he was uh, colorblind, so he was rejected. Mm -hmm. And here I was. I, I passed physical and the, and the uh, written, written test, yeah. and uh, so then here I was, an old uh, T sergeant, they call him, uh, three stripes with a T underneath it, and uh, I was a high-speed radio operator and all this crap, and, and uh, so out of the whole division, I think there were 17 guys uh, that had passed the written and the physical and all for the Air Force. And so we went to Shepherd Field, Texas mm -hmm. and uh, for reassignment because they would, they were sending us to uh, different colleges, uh, what they call the CTD program, to train you in the uh, uh, higher mathematics and map reading and all of this stuff uh, before you went into primary uh, to fly an airplane down in Santa Ana, California. So anyway, at Shepherd Field, Texas, that was the uh, a hole of the whole United States. There wasn't anything to do, <laughs> and we we weren't assigned permanently or anything. <laughs> To any duty, you know, all we did was lay around, and and in the evening we drank beer, and, and at that time they had the wax, this first coming into the service, and uh, we'd sit on the bank and watch the wax <laughs> in their barracks. <laughs> what, are the, what does the wax stand for? Wax was women uh, soldiers oh. that uh, were clerks, and they didn't do any fighting in those days, right. but uh, that's what they called them, wax. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, eventually I got my orders and I went to, uh, to uh, the University of Minnesota for my uh, college training. And uh, I was there for six months and we lived in the, in the bottom of the uh, stadium and uh, all they had the, barracks and all of this stuff uh, set up and uh, we went to use the uh, student union building to eat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they didn't have football games anymore? Oh yeah. Yeah? And all we had to do was go out and, uh, on the, <laughs> the football field was right there. <laughs> but uh, we didn't have much time off then because uh, if you got one day off to do something, you know, you, you, maybe you could leave, say at 10 o'clock in the morning, you had to be back at 6 that evening or whatever. You never did have an overnight pass. Mm -hmm. But anyway, after the CD, TD, CD, TD training, uh, we were given a overnight pass, the first one I'd had in six months, so we get, we went into the Minneapolis at the Radisson Hotel. We got a hotel room, a bunch of us. Uh, I think there was three or four of us, pitched all of our money in, and, and we had every bar in town. 
<laughs> drinking all week. <laughs> the next day, when I went back to uh, check in, I saw all these guys gathered around the bulletin board. And I thought, uh-oh, they got the, uh, you know, the orders up for the guys to be shipping out because they were all through and, and the next stop was uh, to pro what they call primary training. Because we'd already flown a little Cub airplane, had 10 hours in it. But uh, I get down to the bulletin board and the word was out. Anybody with uh, ground force experience, they were being kicked out of the Air Force and uh, going back to their respective branches that uh, they were in before we went to the, the uh, college. And uh, so I didn't feel too bad. I think I figured I'd go to an armored unit or something. And lo and behold, I, when I got my orders, I went to the 76th Infantry Division. And they were in Camp McCoy, West Wisconsin. <laughs> and you talk about a rough and ready bunch. <laughs> they had just come off of winter maneuvers up in, the, I think, in Wisconsin, Michigan, up in there, you know. And I mean, it was cold. And uh, these guys, uh, I ended up in Battery A. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was supposed to be a platoon sergeant. I, I didn't know beans about the infantry. <laughs> what the hell? And these guys, they'd see us uh, coming and they'd say, Woo, look at that P-38, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a big deal. Anyway, uh, they didn't know what the heck to do with me. So finally, in preparation to go overseas, you had to uh, throw three live grenades. That was one of the things. And lo and behold, I was the guy in charge of, of uh, qualifying the whole damn division. <laughs> and uh, so I'd go to the firing range every day and stand there and these guys, you know, mark off the names and all this crap. And uh, so I had this uh, Sergeant Eddie Pizarki was his name, good Polak boy from Pennsylvania. <laughs> and uh, I'd get in, they, they stood retreat, you know, from, you had to be in full uniform and, and uh, all spit and polished and all that crap. At six o'clock, then you'd go have your evening meal, and uh, I'd come rolling in about four or six or something, and go in taking a shower or something. And old Eddie Pizarki, he was always on my case. Damn you! You fool around and you don't never stand retreat. I said, hell, I don't have to. So <laughs> this goes on for about two weeks, and I told this guy that I was working that I said I want to get even with that sucker. I want to scare the hell out of him. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to defuse this damn hand grenade, which I did. I took the, the pin, I took the, the uh, firing mechanism, or I took the explosive, the explosive part out and uh, put her back together. And I put it in the, well, like Charlie's, Backpack, like we call them music bags. You carried your uh, canteen and you know a mess kit and stuff like that in there. Mm -hmm. And I put it in my music bag. We go back in and I threw it on my bunk. And here come old Eddie Pizarki. <laughs> Why in the hell didn't you get in here so you could stand retreat? And I said, you know something, Eddie. I said, I'm tired of your BS. I said, I'm going to blow this out. I reached in my music bag and I pulled out this hand grenade. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I'm tired of fooling around. I'm going to blow this joint up. And I started to pull the pin and I dropped it. <laughs> and he took off like a bolt of lightning. And all these guys were laughing. And honest to God, the uh, 
motor pool was about 200 yards from the barracks over to that. <laughs> And by the time we got to the back door, he was standing down in the motor, in the motor pool, waiting for the barracks to blow up. And he was a big sucker. And he'd come back and he was going to kick the hell out of me, which it wouldn't have taken him long to do. <laughs> anyway, the guys wouldn't let him do it. And, uh, so he, but he didn't bother me anymore. So anyway, uh, the next highlight in my career is... Uh, but since I didn't have any duties here, I wasn't the damned uh, infantry. And I wasn't a squad leader, but I had the rank. You know, they didn't know what the hell to do with me, so uh, they put me on guard duties, at the corporal of the guard. Mm -hmm. And I told the lieutenant, I said, hell, I don't have to pull corporal. Yeah, you do. He said, we're short. So, go, you're the corporal of the guard. So, okay. So I go around and posted the, the damn guard and uh, on the way back to the barracks so I saw these buddies of mine they were going into the canteen hey come in and have a beer I said I can't I'm on guard they, oh hell nobody will know it so anyway I had a carbine on my shoulder so I set it down in the corner went over and got a, a bottle of beer <laughs> instead of shooting the bull and drinking beer and this 90-day uh, wonder come in, you know, shave tail. Mm -hmm. Sergeant, where's your carbine? I said, sitting over there, sir. You can't leave a, a loaded gun unattended. He said, uh, you're the sergeant or corporal of the guard. Get it. Let's go. And he threw me in the brig. <laughs> <laughs> Busted me. <laughs> I was in the brig for about three or four days. <laughs> and uh, so then they transferred me to, uh, uh, I think it was Battery B in the 76th Infantry Division. And uh, I think it was what they called the 142nd uh, uh, Megan's got my book, I can't remember all of the 142nd Battalion. 76th entry. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I ended up uh, being a buck private, and I was the captain's personal radio operator. Was that because you were demoted? Yeah. <laughs> stripped. <laughs> so, anyway, he was a nice old boy, uh, old captain was, and uh, Finally, he said, hell, if, if you're going to be my radio operator, I'm going to promote you to a T, T, uh, two-striper, you know, like a corporal. Mm -hmm. But T-5 was a, a corporal's uh, pay, but you were just a radio operator. So anyway, uh, it turned out real, real nice. We went overseas, left from uh, Massachusetts. I went overseas on a on the uh, Kaiser, what they call Liberty Boats. Mm -hmm. And I think it was about, I don't remember now how long it was, but we had uh, oh, three or four, I don't know whether we had the whole division on this one boat or not. I don't remember now, Richard, but there was a hell of a slug of guys there. and. Uh, Anyway, the thing that I remember about the old Liberty boat, they were thrown together, what they call the Kaiser uh, steel belt, mm -hmm. and you could sit on the on the biffy down below, and you could see up big old cracks in the in the in the back of the boat, <laughs> that's where the where the seams come together. You know, hell, it was you could throw a cat through there. <laughs> it was up so far to open the rest of the way. But anyway, it was very uneventful. Uh, I never did get sick going overseas. And we landed in, uh, in Bournemouth, England. And uh, we spent about three or four months there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got uh, 
Well, we got three-day passes every once in a while. And, uh, so this one guy and I uh, that uh, kind of chummed around together went into uh, London. And at that time, the uh, USO set up places for us to sleep. It didn't cost us anything. But it was usually some very low quality place. And this thing in London, uh, or England, and it, it's chilly and foggy mm -hmm. and cold. I mean, it just penetrates you. <laughs> so anyway, this, this guy said, hell, I'm not going to stay in this damn place. I said, well, I'm not either. Let's go get us a hotel room. So he said, okay. So we go out, get a hotel room, and, and with it come a bed and it's what they call a bed and breakfast. So we'd been out screwing around, went to USO, and was dancing and drinking and having a hell of a time, and, and uh, come back, it's cold, and they had these old gas heaters that filled them up with quarters. And uh, so we filled the damn thing up and went to bed. And uh, the next thing I remember, I, was, I woke up when I was in this damn ambulance going to the hospital. And uh, I asked this, uh, Bill Wilson, my buddy, I said, where in the hell are we, what's going on? And he said, well, when we, uh, the damn flame went out on our heater like Mm -hmm. And when the guy knocked on the door mm -hmm. to call us for breakfast, mm -hmm. he uh, he got up and he was real almost gassed, got the door open and passed out. And when the guy walked back down the hall, he came in and he found me. I was already passed out. <laughs> you saved your life. <laughs> he did, really. <laughs> so anyway, we ended up in the damn hospital for about three or four days. And on a special diet and all that crap, but I didn't know harm came or anything. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, that was the highlight of my stay in England. <laughs> 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 and uh, right after that, then we went across the English Channel and uh, the, the thing that I remember about the English Channel, we loaded all of our equipment on it, and there, I forget now what the LTL or something, I don't remember the name of it, but they were flat bottom boats, and they'd post the guards, you know, up, they'd tie the vehicles down uh, to secure them, mm -hmm. and uh, you'd sit there and wind the down bottom of the boat be up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. Well, if you sat there and watched it long enough, you'd get sick at your belly. <laughs> you know, and you'd upchuck. <laughs> and most of the guys did. And uh, that's what I remember across the English Channel. <laughs> and uh, from there, it's a whole different story, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> I ended up uh, Let's, let's take a rest for a minute, can Oh, sure. Turn it down. I want to get a drink of water. So we got, I think we're up to the, when you cross the channel. Yeah, so uh, we went to uh, this uh, port called La Harve. And uh, the 76th Infantry, uh, we landed, of course, this was, oh, I don't know, quite a little while after the initial landing. It was, this was in the fall, and uh, so La Harve, there was, we'd already, the, the Americans had already taken on France back, uh -huh. and uh, so the French, or the Germans, I think it was the Megano mm -hmm. oh, no, 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 Fortress. Uh -huh. The French and the Germans on the on the border. 
you know, the country just run together like a state here. Right. And uh, they had the build in uh, bunkers and uh, all, and the uh, government. Uh, to do a real good job, I need my book. The Elbe River, I believe, is the little river where the 417th, my battalion, the whole, you know, the, the, the divisions, the service company, and the, uh -huh. all of this and that, was called the 417th in the uh, 76th Division, uh -huh. Infantry Division. Anyway, the original company I was in, Richard, in the infantry division was Company A. Mm -hmm. uh, they attacked, and the Germans put up some pretty good resistance. And I didn't happen to be in that particular battalion, you know, infantry. Mm -hmm. But just to show you how lucky I was, they lost 80% of the guys on, in the first battle. And uh, my particular job after I was still in the uh, artillery, Battery B, and uh, I was the old man's radio operator. So what we did, they assigned Bob Ferner and myself as radio operators, and Bill Wilson was the truck driver. Well, we had this uh, 508 series uh, radio mounted in the half track, and uh, our job was to get up close enough to where we could get by the infantry and uh, relay, if they needed artillery fire, we'd relay the message back to uh, the artillery. and. We'd zero in. We'd kind of like, you know, just relay the message talk back there. and forth, you yeah. know. Uh, and uh, sometimes we would be real close to the front line, and sometimes I'd be a little farther back. I didn't want to get any closer than I had to. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not stupid. Huh? You're not stupid. <laughs> but anyway, we had real good duty, and old Bob, or Bill Wilson, was a damn good cook. And uh, we had a good, uh, our forward observer, believe it or not, was Captain Smuck, was his name. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he told us, he said, you guys go anywhere you want to go, just as long as you stay within the perimeter of, of the infantry, so you, you know, you won't be exposed too much, and whenever you can Get your communications while well, you can you can do it the way you want to do it. So, what I'm just highlighting some of the experiences I had. They uh, they seemed like the infantry always attacked, ticked off. You know, about one or two or three o'clock in the morning on the darkest nights of the the year. You couldn't see your hand in front of you, and the Germans. Uh, when we, when we were going through uh, France, Paris, they had, I think they had liberated, but the rest, Eastern Germany, or next to France, next to Germany, was still, uh, you know, they were fighting pretty good. And uh, this one night, uh, this other, the guys from another uh, outfit was, uh, running the radios, they couldn't get contact with the infantry. So the first sergeant came over and told us we'd have to get out and see if we could pick up the infantry because they were calling for for fire. They were pinned down and they couldn't uh, move. So everything was blacked out. You couldn't see nothing. And Bob or I would walk in front of the damn uh, truck. And, uh, Keep her hand on it, you know, so we could stay in the road, fumble along, if you can imagine this. We didn't know where in the hell we were going. And uh, 
finally we ran into some 88s. <laughs> well, they were different. A howitzer throws shells up, you know, in an arc. An 88 is just like a rifle or something like that, except it's an 88 millimeter gun. Shoots uh, straight because if you get behind the hill or down in the depression or something, they can't. They can keep you pinned down, but they can't hit you. Mm -hmm. Well, we were lucky. We happened to be in this damn valley, and uh, we weren't too low. They, when they zeroed in on us, I don't know how in the hell they ever found us, but they did. But we pulled it, <laughs> got out, and we dug a foxhole. All three of us, big enough for all three of us. And all we had was these little bitty damn shovels, like these garden deals. And I, we dug that sucker about six foot deep, <laughs> enough for three guys in nothing flat. <laughs> and we were there for, uh, oh shit, I think about, oh, the rest of that night and the next day. And when we got out of there, because these Germans were just over the hill, but they couldn't get us down in the valley. And uh, that was the closest I had ever been to really getting into a lot of trouble <laughs> at that point. But anyway. They didn't fire back at them? Huh? Did they fire back at them? Oh yeah, we, we finally we had communications. Luckily, whenever we got down in the damn foxhole, we had extensions on our mic, you know, so we could right. uh, talk and uh, they, they knocked them out eventually. But, uh, then we were assigned to Patton's, I think it was Patton's Third Army. That he was the general on the top of the whole deal. And lo and behold, at that time he was moving so fast when we hit Germany. He was going so damn fast, Richard, that the ground in the tanks and the half tracks and all this, the foot soldiers couldn't keep up. So they were riding, the infantry was riding on these half-tracks and tanks and then they'd get into battle, they'd, you know, jump out, jump down and go at it. And lo and behold, I was in the 6th Armored when I left, left him in Camp Cook, California. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, one day I started seeing these patches, 6th Armored. And I kept inquiring about my old uh, outfit, and I ran into him. You know, and who in the hell would believe this story? And uh, we were, I forget now what, what part of uh, uh, Germany we were in, the town or anything, but I, I saw a whole lot of my old buddies. Well, <laughs> the last thing I remember on this particular time we were sitting in this half track, and everybody, you, you'd raid these uh, wine cellars, had all kinds of wine, and <laughs> cognac, and, and snops, and the last time I remember, it's about eight or ten of us sitting in this damn half track, and everybody had their own bottle, they'd pass it on, and <laughs> I passed out. <laughs> The next day, morning, I woke up and I was in this building. And uh, a lot of the buildings over there are built like courtyards that down, you know, there's community deals mm -hmm. with a big courtyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked out and I didn't see a damn soul. Got up and looked out the window and I didn't see a damn soul. And I thought, oh hell, these guys have taken off and left me. What in the hell's going on here? So anyway, I scrambled around, and whoever put me to bed, I had my bed roll, you know. <laughs> Rolled it up, and I went down, and here everybody was outside of the courtyard. I was looking on the inside of the courtyard. Right. Damn, so we're up. Here they all were out here. So we got all loaded up and took off. And <laughs> everything was all right, but we... The next big battle, before it was all over, was the Battle of the Bulge. And I like to throw my rear end off there. 
we slept in the, in the same clothes. You'd go to bed with everything on, in the, in the haystack, in the hayloft of these old barns, and freeze to death. And it was so cold when the kitchen got up and they served you oatmeal. By the time it hit your shit skillet, your musket, musket, musket. <laughs> that's what they call them. Was, uh, uh, what did they mess get? Mm -hmm. By the time it hit it, it damn near froze. <laughs> I mean, it was cold. <laughs> and that's when, uh, uh, I forget now the story of the generals that this, uh, they had these Americans pinned down, the infantry, and this famous general, I used to know his name, and Chris has got my book, damn it. I wish you'd bring that back. It's well, got all was, that information in it. I was going to give Richard the book, and I wrote all that other stuff out that you told me the story. I want you to tell me the story where you were in that barn. Well, I, I already gonna... passed that, but I'll go back. Oh, but yeah, anyway, tell him that story. Okay. Hey, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, these poor guys in the infantry were pinned down in the foxholes, and their feet it could freeze. It would be wet. Big sores. They'd bring socks up, Richard, from the from the back, you know, from the supply depot right. to the front lines by the truck loads and give these guys new socks or clean socks to get them out to them because it was a hell of a deal. I mean, it was, and we were lucky, that's for damn sure. But anyway, this, these Germans had them all pinned down and they had it uh, surrounded. And the, the German general asked for a, for a surrender. And this is when the, the, uh, the American commander told him, nuts to you. And the German, he didn't know what the hell it meant. <laughs> so anyway, but before that, and uh, like I told you, right after we were pinned down, and when there was some still some resistance and fighting, and the infantry took off about 2 o'clock in the morning, and, I'd been on the radio most of the night, and old Bob Verner, he said, uh, he'd gotten some sleep, and he said, Don, he said, I'll take over, and, and you go on these, this, uh, this old stable over here, and uh, we, the, the guards were all posted around the infantry, and uh, get some sleep. I said, okay, so I took my sleeping bag, and got undressed, or didn't get undressed, I crawled in it and went to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many hours later, four or five hours later, I heard somebody talking, but it wasn't English. Uh oh So I was scared. Did, did you have a sidearm with you? <laughs> no, but it was laid outside of my, my, it was laying there, but I couldn't, uh, you know, I could reach it. But I was peered out from underneath, and all I saw was German soldiers. Now, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Finally, I realized that they were using the stable as a uh, prison, or you know, where they the captured Germans, oh. <laughs> bringing them back. And uh, there was three or four of us sleeping in there, and I didn't know. <laughs> But anyway, I was scared fartless. <laughs> <laughs> but they were just prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> but that was another funny experience that I had. And, uh, oh, we'd gone I don't know how long without a shower. We'd shave, take a sponge bath in our helmet, you know. We'd get a little hot water, do it that way. And uh, so we got to go back for a rest period. This was before the Battle of the Bulls. Chris screwing up my routine. But anyway, uh, they took us for hot showers. And they had these portable showers set up, you know, 
And I'll bet you there was a thousand guys in there taking a shower. <laughs> but boy, it was so wonderful. You, I, I must have stayed in there for an hour, just <coughs> soaking and all of this and that. And then they gave us a 24-hour pass. Well, my buddy, they were going to Luxembourg. And uh, so my buddy, Bob Werner, all you could get at the uh, USO was coffee and donuts. And he had a yen for ice cream. He wanted some ice cream so bad. And every line he'd see, you know, where the guys were chewed up, he'd say, oh, hell, maybe they got ice cream there. So anyway, we chewed up in this line in Luxembourg. And it went around the corner. And when we finally got up there, and it went up the stairs to the second floor. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, these guys were going in, and about 10 minutes they'd come out, in and out, in and out. Finally, I told Bob, I said, Bob, I think we're in the wrong line. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a brothel? Yeah. <laughs> Yay, Jack. What do you think, huh? Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was uh, an experience that I wouldn't take a million dollars for, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. Yeah. Because it was it was quite little thing, a little old guy from Missouri had never been, you know, very far from home except when I come to California and went back before I joined the National Guard. But this goes back to the beginning in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, when we were in basic training down there. I was in a barracks by the guy, with a guy named John Turpin. And uh, we always seem to pull KP together, guard duty together, you know. And uh, when we were on KP, uh, we'd get, you know, the potatoes all peeled, or the, we'd have an hour or so uh, in the afternoon or from breakfast to lunch. And usually we'd uh, roll the dice for a beer. And the guy lost it, go up and. Uh, buy the beer back. So John had beaten me for six months. He never did buy a beer. <laughs> and he had always was rolling the dice. And finally one day, I guess he got soft hearted. And he said, Don, he said, I want you to watch real close. I said, okay. So we, I was sitting on one end of the, of the bed and he was on the other end and he rolled the dice out. All of a sudden, they changed colors. And I said, what the hell? And he showed me how I could palm a set of dice and roll them out. And uh, this was the beginning of my experience as a gambler. He taught me how to even roll the dice on an army gun. <laughs> and uh, in his duffel bag, he had over 100 sets of dice. And some of them were, oh, uh, I don't remember the, the nomenclature on them, but you couldn't roll anything but a seven or eleven on a right, damn Right, uh, uh, craps. Uh, no, no craps. No craps. Just yeah. seven or eleven. Right. Or numbers. You could make numbers on them, but no craps. And uh, different ones. And some of them were loaded to where you could you'd roll and they'd always come up with the same number showing. <laughs> well he cut these in and out as a crap game. Nobody had ever seen. And he could hit a wall and spin the bottom dice and kill a five or a six or whatever he wanted. You know, which give him a pretty good advantage. So after he showed me all this, he said, I need a guy to act as my front man for me. Would you be interested? And of course I said, hell yeah, Doc. You know, easy money, I'll do it. <laughs> so anyway, 
I went with him. He wouldn't shoot crap in our outfit. He'd go to some other company, you know. Right. Every payday he'd take off. And so the first payday after this, I went with him. And he'd make a sign. I forget now the sign, but anyway, uh, I was doing the betting. He was doing, of course, he was doing a little betting and doing the rolling, but I was doing the heavy betting. And uh, he'd give me the sign, and I'd start laying it out there and breaking it in. <laughs> old John would give me the sign, and I'd, you know, cut the bet down. And that was the only time I went and I said, John, if somebody caught us doing this, they'd kill you. you know, and they would. They wouldn't fool around. Yeah. And I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. But I did learn to even roll the dice on an army blanket. Well, I could still do that today, that's easy. But anyway, uh, that was the beginning of my gambling in the service, way back. So after the Battle of the Bulge, it, that was the last big battle. And uh, we got within, oh gosh, I don't know, about 50, 60 kilometers from Berlin, and uh, then they told us to hold it. And the Russians, they, they had an agreement with the Russians that they took over Berlin, and this time the war was all over. Right, because the Russians had lost so many people. Yeah. And, uh, so I uh, know Stalin and, the, and he and Roosevelt had it all fixed up so they could get some glory. And, we get some glory and that. But it was a, a shame in a way that the Germans, these prison camps, you couldn't believe how those people looked. And these incinerators that would burn them up, gas chambers. Did you see it? It's sickening. Did you see it? sick. The way that they. and. 90% of the guys, normal people in the German army, they didn't even know what the hell was going on. Just the Gestapo was really new. Right. And it's amazing how this thing yeah, was set yeah, up to work with, that Hitler could pull all of this off. So that was terrible. Did you, see any, did you see any of those camps? Yeah. But you only want to see, I only saw one and that's all you'd want to see. Make you sick. Absolutely sick. And I bet the, the end, prisoners were happy to see you. Oh, hell yes. And the, the German people, after the war, uh, we get a ration uh, each week. We get so many cigarettes, you know, and uh, a bottle of cognac. And uh, so we were in this little, after the war, we were in this little town of uh, Triptus, Germany. Mm -hmm. And we were patrolling the arm, or the area around us. And we were on guard duty, what, 24 hours? Yeah. And off uh, 48. Uh huh. And. Uh, Make sure Jack didn't screw it up. Anyway, huh? I just want to make sure Jack didn't screw it up. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Eddie Pizarki, who was our uh, communications sergeant, he spoke enough German that uh, he could get by. Get issues. What, I think that's what they call it. But anyway, old Eddie uh, set it up where he took over this beer garden. And where he found it, I don't know, we, this brewery, he went out over and they got all of these kegs of beer and set them up because the beer gardens were closed. The Germans, they went from them, they couldn't get beer or anything else. Old Eddie got it, we opened up the beer gardens and uh, they were, uh, I don't remember now the exact story, but there was about 30 or 40 girls.
that were from the movie industry from Berlin mm -hmm. that had been moved back to this little town uh, in the Bear Garden because they had lodging there and all this stuff in the Bear Garden. And uh, at that time, if you got caught fraternizing with the German people, it was a $75 fine, and then you were confined to uh, quarters. You know? And 75 bucks is a hell of a lot of money when you're making 35 a month. <laughs> anyway, he set this up and we would go over after dark, take over the beer garden, and dance, and drink, and raise hell. <laughs> You didn't know that, did you, Mom? No, and I seem like since I've been here, all I've heard is about what you did drinking in the service. Well, <laughs> there was a few rougher times than that. I don't want to talk about those times. Well, There's but nothing honey, to talk that's about. Part what of the your hell? Victory. Huh? That's part of what this was all about. It wasn't all just one gamble or one drinking bout. Well, I wasn't that brave of a guy. I was a coward. He told me a couple stories. Well, what I'm hoping but is, well. Anyway, it's, uh, we stayed there, and, uh, oh, I don't remember now how long it was. Uh, uh, when the, the war in Germany, I think, ended in, uh, sometime in May. I don't remember the exact date. But anyway, at that time, you had to have 105 points. You got so many points for service in the in the United States, and so much, so many points for overseas. Mm -hmm. And anybody that had 105 points were eligible for discharge to ship back to the states and get out of the service. Because, but the war in the South Pacific was still going on. Well, I had 102 points, three short of getting out of the damn service, so they reassigned me to go back to the South Pacific. So I, anyway, they sent me back home uh, for, I got a 30-day furlough. But on the way back, uh, we had moved from uh, Triptus back to Frankfurt, which was a staging area. And uh, this, uh, outfit, uh, well, part of the guys I was with were coming back to be discharged. And part of us was coming back to be redeployed to the South Pacific. But anyway, one evening, I think it was Frankfurt, it was level. There wasn't a building standing in Frankfurt, Germany. Of course, we were outside the, of the city mm -hmm. in the camp in La Havre, France, to get on the boat to come back home. And uh, so one evening I was on the way to, I went to the latrine and I could hear these dice clicking and rolling and the flashlights. <laughs> Uh oh. I think we were at, um, we were talking about the, uh, right when you were discharged. When they oh, took you on back. my redeployment? Anyway. Before you were redeployed. At uh, La Havre, France, where they, uh, where we were brought together to go back to England and uh, come back to the States. And But anyway, on the, on the way back from the latrine that night in La Havre, I heard these dice rolling in the flashlight. So I thought, well, I'll try my luck. And sure enough, they had an army blanket down. And I won, uh, I think it was about 3,800 bucks. <laughs> That's about, a lot of money. Back then, it was a hell of a lot of money. About, about 25, 30 minutes, all it took me. And I took off. And uh, I ran into uh, an 
No, I didn't at that time. I just stuck the money in my uh, barracks bag. Nobody knew it was there or anything. So anyway, when we get back to England in the staging area, I was lucky enough to come home on the Queen Mary, Richard. Oh, really? Yeah. Down the one down in Long Beach right now. Yeah. And uh, when we got on the boat, uh, they had, I think, a whole division that are equal to that many men. We were assigned a bunk, and we, we could stay in the bunk one night, and we had to go out on deck the next night. And we were only about three or four days, you know, that thing. That was a fast boat. It was a fast boat, didn't even need any uh, battleships to guard it from, from sub because it could run away and leave anything <laughs> at that particular time. But anyway, uh, on the boat I run into this guy from my hometown who was an observation pilot. And I forget now what outfit he was in, but Billy Blyche, and he was a captain, I believe, at the time. And I told him, I said, Bill, I got 3,000 bucks here that I want you to put in the officer's uh, vault, and don't give it to me under any circumstance till I get to Albany, Missouri. And he said, okay. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, I played uh, Pinochle, and then the second day out, word drifted down, you know, that on the top deck, it was a big crap game going on. And, uh, I mean, it was a big one, <laughs> and it was on the right side of the middle stack. So if you ever see the middle stack on the Queen Mary, this is where your old grandpa dropped his bankroll. <laughs> <laughs> so you lost your money. <laughs> I went up and uh, I made a few side bets, and I lost what little uh, four or five hundred that I had on me from what I'd won, you know, and I. Went down, I got a hold of Bill, and he said, you told me not to give it to you, to you, you got to Albany. I said, well, I, I got a chance to win some big, big money if I get hot. And if I don't, I said, I haven't lost anything anyway. Okay, so he gave me 3,000 bucks, <laughs> and uh, I made side bets, you know, and all this stuff, and I got a hold of the dice, finally. I made all kinds of side bets and everything you could think of. <laughs> and I come out on a nine. And I rolled and rolled and rolled. And I never did make the nine. But I made a little. But anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up, I lost my bankroll. And uh, so, easy come, easy go. <laughs> But that's just a, kind of a highlight. And you lost it on the way, on, in the Atlantic. Huh? You lost it in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, right. But the guy that was a big winner, uh, he'd won $45,000, which in those days was big, big money. And he had money in every pocket, and he hired two guys to guard him. And uh, because he, if somebody had gotten a hold of him, they'd have thrown him overboard. <laughs> you know, and another guy won about, uh, I heard, 22,000. So, you know, if you could have, that was the two big winners. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I might have gotten a lot of trouble if I'd won a lot of money. Because at that age, you're not very smart. And uh, so then when I got home, I, we landed in New Jersey, Fort Dix. And uh, and I went to uh, Albany, you know. And, uh, while I was on furlough, uh, the 
war in Japan was over with. And uh, they said that they wouldn't need me, you know, that I could go to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis and, and you saw my discharge. And, uh, that's where I was discharged from. But I was home, shoot, uh, six, some of them six months and the rest of them a year before the guys that had 105 points to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the end of my career in the Army. Yeah. But if maybe I can, uh, if I get my book back from your mother, and I'll dig around and I can cover the area. We got a book. The division printed up after the war of uh, the exact route that our outfit took across the France, and, right. and the Battle of the Bulls, highlight of the doll, and the guys that uh, were killed, and uh, all that. So. Did you? Uh, so af after you were discharged, then, then what did you do then? Well, my dad uh, wanted me to go on the farming business with him. But uh, when I was a kid growing up, going to school, there wasn't any money back there. Wasn't any money. I worked in a, when I was going to high school, and I made 275 a week working in the vegetable department. I'd work after school on Saturday. Well, back in those days, on a Saturday night, a, I was a clerk at a grocery store, and the people would come in, and you'd write down their order, what they wanted, and they'd go on to the movie. On Saturday night, I, they could go to a 10-cent movie. Well, and I'm, they could take the whole family. Kids got in free, and the daddy and mama paid 20 cents. <coughs> Mm -hmm. And they'd sit there till the movie's over, and they'd come in maybe at 12, 1 o'clock, and uh, pay for their groceries, and we'd have them all bagged up for them, and they'd take off. But for $2.75 a week, can you believe that? So anyway, uh, I told Dad, I said, I don't want to be a farmer. I want to be, I want to be in sales. That's what I, that was my goal in high school, believe it or not, it wasn't very high, but in those days, when you're a kid, uh, no money, and I'd see these dudes come into town, you know, selling meat or groceries or whatever, driving a nice car and a suit and all this, I thought, oh boy, that's what I want to do, be a traveling salesman. <laughs> so that's what I ended up doing, but uh, I was happy doing it. But anyway, after, right after I got out of the service, uh, as June said, I mentioned doing a lot of drinking. And when I come back from the service, and this is nothing to be proud of, but I want to tell you the truth. I could take a bottle of booze, old granddad or old Taylor bourbon, mm -hmm. drink it just like water. That's you know, mm -hmm. that's bad. Nothing to be a proud of. And after I was home for maybe three or four weeks, uh, there was one other guy that he was a 4F. He never did get into the service. And he had a car, and he and I would go to Kansas City or St. Joe and drinking and raising hell. And my mom, bless her soul, told me one morning that uh, I had two choices. I could hit the road or quit drinking because she wasn't going to put up with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so being a, a smart aleck and a know-it-all, I said, okay. And I packed my bag and, and I went to Kansas City, got a job as a bartender, went to bartender school. And I worked at the Belle Reeve and the uh, Mulewalk Hotel in Kansas City, the two big ones. 
And uh, oh, I was there about, I don't know, not three or four months, I guess. Not very long. And it was winter time, and one day it'd be 60 degrees, the next day it'd be freezing. Mm -hmm. And the guy that I was staying with, Hugh Wayman, I said, Hugh, I can't stand this weather. I'm going to California. Well, the guy that owned the Belle Reve Hotel owned the Chapman Park in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles. So he, uh, the head bartender at the Belle Reve gave me a letter of recommendation to the guy out of Chapman Park. So I came out here and I had my aunt, Aunt Vesta, she's laying in a rest home today, 94 years old, just about ready to cross over the line. And uh, anyway, I stayed with her and uh, this is when I met uh, June, shortly thereafter. I, I didn't want to be a bartender, I, I still wanted to get into sales. And uh, so I went to work for, uh, well first of all, I went to real estate school. When I first hit California, a bartender, and I went to real estate school, got my license. And I was working for this little real estate office right now, El Sereno little suburb of L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time I had met uh, your grandmother and uh, she was the most beautiful woman <laughs> and I uh, fell in love head over heels. <laughs> and uh, so anyway we decided that uh, what you shouldn't do, but hell, I, I don't think we'd known each other very long. And uh, about two or three months, and we got married. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, well, in the meantime, I had gone to work for the bank, too. And then I still, I wanted to get into sales. That, that's the, main thing. Well, on the real estate deal, I was just working on the weekends. I didn't have any money. To be in the real estate business, you got to have some money to back you up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in, uh, I think it's Flint Ridge, which is in, was in, out towards Glendale, out in, in the high rent district, and I sat on an open house out there one weekend. And uh, these people came in from New York, two sisters with their brother. And they decided the weather back east was not for them, they wanted to come to California. And this big old house had a price list of close to $40,000. And they gave me a deposit, so they'd take it. Well, hell, I was walking about that far off the ground, you know. Big commission. Oh, well, hell yes, 5%. You know, I, had to, I give the broker 1% of it. And, uh, and the, uh, I don't think, I, I didn't make, I think I ended up, I would have made about 3%, which was uh, about 1200 bucks, which is a hell of a lot of money. Anyway, the next week, after we wrote up the proposal and all this and that, these people went on back to New York and they decided they didn't want to, want to take the place, so I lost the deal. Mm -hmm. And I told the broker, I said, the heck with this, I can't, I gotta have some money. Because I was married, you know, and I right. said, I, I gotta get me a job to make some money. So I got a job at Dorman Hotel Supply Company, working at the, uh, the, uh, plant down in Vernon, making, uh, they put me in there as the inventory clerk, but they made custom-made uh, kitchens, mm -hmm. stainless steel uh, heating cabinets, uh, worked 
cables, you know, everything stainless steel. And uh, Mr. Eddie, who was the manager down there at that time, I said, he wanted me to go to school, accounting school, which I started. And I told him, I said, Mr. Eddie, I don't want to be an accountant. I don't want to keep books. Well, you, you can be the manager here if you want. I said, I don't want it. And finally I got through to him. They had a, at that time on 5th and Spring, they had a big old uh, store, Dorman's did, for drop-ins, you know, where they had all the rest of the equipment uh, displayed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he finally talked Mr. Sharkey, the sales manager, in as a, to let me come down as a sales trainee. So I was working there on the, oh, I don't know, three or four months. And uh, I had, I think we bought a, what the hell year was it, 47? Forget now the model. New Chevrolet, you couldn't buy one. And I had bought this old Chevrolet back in, uh, in Albany, my dad had got it for me, and it was, hell, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old when I bought it. And uh, so I wanted a new car, and I bought it, my first car from Calio Chevrolet in South Pasadena. And I paid him $500 under the table to get it, and June's mother uh, helped me get it, financed it for me, helped me with the payment. Anyway, uh, right after that, they told me I could be on a, a learner's uh, route for a Dorman Hotel Supply. At that time, uh, San Bernardino, Riverside, Redlands, that was out in the country, Palm Springs, uh, and I had a few accounts in East Los Angeles. I was peddling dishes. Silverware, anything that you'd see in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. They could completely equip a restaurant, everything. And uh, so we had a kitchen uh, engineer, they called him. And I had got a remodel job at Hudlow's Drive in Redlands. Mm -hmm. And he had a bar and a restaurant. It was a pretty good sized deal, new dishwasher, and we modernized his kitchen and I was working with the, the kitchen engineer, uh, Joe Wyckoff was his name. And uh, so we finished up the job out there on a Friday, I don't know, 11, 12 o'clock. And he said, uh, what are you going to do? And I said, uh, I got to go to Palm Springs. I forget, I think it was the Palms restaurant. Uh, they want me to check out the order, see if there's any dishes broken or glassware, and, mm -hmm. and make sure that everything is there that they wanted. And he said, oh, the hell with it. He said, let's go have a drink. I said, Joe, I got to go do it. Well, I, I'll, I'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. So, we went and had a few drinks, and I didn't even go to Palm Springs. I went back home. Monday morning, I go in, and every Monday morning we had a sales meeting. And then we'd go load our car up with samples and take off for the week. And uh, at the sales meeting, old Sharky didn't say a damn word. And this was, I don't know, close to noon. I was just had my car loaded up over the loudspeaker, they called for me to come up to Sharkey's office. And here was Joe Wyckoff. And uh, the dirty SOB laid everything on to me, you know. That, uh, because the Palms restaurant had called, said that the salesman hadn't shown up and they were madder than the devil. And anyway, I was terminated. <laughs> And I told Joe, I said, if I ever see you outside of Mr. Sharkey's office, I'm going to kick your butt all over Los Angeles, you lying SOB. Yeah. So anyway, I was out of a job, and this was, and as I recall, just before Christmas. 
And yeah. he's Boy, I'll tell you, it's tough. But anyway, <laughs> this, I could go on forever, Richard, <laughs> tell you little stories, but anyway, uh, I went to this agency and uh, they called me up and they said, that, do you know anything about meat? And I said, no, I know a pork chop from a steak, that's about it, and I was raised on a farm. And uh, well, it cut a hay packing company, which was one of the big packers in Los Angeles, it was looking for salesmen. And I said, oh, okay, so I go over 803 Macy Street, and Mr. Murphy is a sales manager, and uh, I filled out my application, and my work history wasn't very long, and I dormant, and I just put down fired. <laughs> so anyway, I go in for the interview with Mr. Murphy, and he was going over it, you know, and, and uh, asked me if I knew anything about meat. I said no, but I'm willing to learn. I know a pork chop and a steak, that's about it, Mr. Murphy. And, and he said, well, what does this mean here you were fired? <laughs> And I told him, and he said, anybody that's got, uh, is that honest <laughs> to tell me the truth? He said, I want him working for me. You've got a job. I said, oh boy. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And anyway, after I went to work for, uh, to, uh, at Cudahy, I was supposed to be working with uh, Joe Brosick was a supervisor, and of all places to end up, my route was in Watts. That was the beginning route. All, damn near all black, but uh, there was a few black owners, but most of them were white, mm -hmm. but in a black area. So anyway, the second day that Joe and I started to work, he said, Don, he said, here's the route, but we're supposed to I think it was on a Tuesday. He said, uh, these are the stops that we got to go in this order. And he said, my brother's coming in from back east and he wants to go to the horse races out of Hollywood Park. Can you find it? I said, yeah, I can find my way around. So anyway, that was my training with him. I never did see him anymore except to ride with me maybe a couple of hours or something. But back. During the war, Cudahy was involved in what they called the black market. And uh, these guys had ordered, little, they had hundreds of these little individual uh, meat markets, grocery stores, on every, darn near every corner. Not the big chains like you got today. And oh, well, there were a few, I think Laos was probably in business then. Mm -hmm. Bonds had a half a dozen stores or something like that. Right. But uh, anyway, I would walk in and these guys uh, tell them, I'm so and so with Cut A Packing Company. And I've had guys pick up the cleaver and they'd say, Get the hell out of here. I said, Wait a minute. I said, I don't know where in the hell you were during the war, but I was overseas. And I said, I didn't have anything to do with cutting ahead in the black market. And I said, I would appreciate a chance to do some business. Mm -hmm. To hell with you, get out of here. So I, that's the way that the, most of the customers greeted me. Some of them, they had been taken care of, they had an end, you know. But if they'd order a dozen pork chops, they'd get six. Order three, a side and a half, or two sides of beef, they'd get a half, you know. But anyway, that's the way I started in the, uh, in the meat business. In the meat business. And, uh, <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's enough, isn't it, for now? Let's just catch the rest of it another time. All right.